Well, here we are. It's the physics video lecture once again. Physics 107B video lecture four. We're going to set up all of the Maxwell's equations today and uh, some boundary conditions and things like that in preparation for theory of waves. So let's start where we left off. We had the Ampere Maxwell law where the displacement current had been introduced in order to make the law consistent. So here's what we have. This is what we ended with. Ampere Maxwell. And we'll just investigate this briefly and then put together the full set of Maxwell's equations and keep going. So here we go. We have the curl of the magnetic field is equal to mu naught current density vector plus mu naught epsilon naught dE dt. <clears throat> so this was the term that was added in order to make the divergence of this right side vanish because of course the divergence of a curl vanishes. So you have to have the divergence of the right side vanish. And this displacement current here, um, J displacement epsilon naught e, e dt displacement current. was just added there, again, on these grounds that the left side curl vanishes, the right side curl has vanished. So there's an interesting model that uh, allows us to visualize what's going on right here. And that model is the charging of a capacitor. So let's just write here, example, charging a capacitor. Capacitor, do I have room to draw it right here? Well, I'll put it on the other board. So here's the thing, suppose we have a battery and over here we have a capacitor, and I'm just going to draw two parallel plates. Okay. So yeah, we close the switch on this, and current flows. In fact, current is going to flow like this, so that we end up with positive on one side, negative on the other. But of course, no physical current crosses this gap. But what we'll see is this displacement current, we could say, crosses the gap. So what we do is, let's see, do the Gaussian surface first. Sure, I'll even draw that little, you know, if you do a Gaussian surface, um, let's do it, let's do it this way. We know that we're going to have, here I'll do this in red, we're going to have electric field across the gap of the capacitor. If you take the parallel plates sufficiently close together, you know, I can try to draw that too. If you take them sufficiently close together like this, then your edge effects are very small. And, and essentially, you just have field inside. You have a uniform field inside. There are some edge effects, but they're going to be negligible. So you essentially just have uniform field inside. Therefore, your Gaussian surface, your Gaussian surface, if it's just something that, wrong color. Goes around, you know, from the middle on side view, your Gaussian surface goes like that, then you're only going to have flux through that Gaussian surface between the two plates. Okay. So that's what we're working towards here. 
a uniform field between the plates. Uniform E comma only between the plate. And now we can just write down the fault. Okay. So first of all, the current here, we're going to have the displacement current is simply going to be I displacement J displacement A, we'll just multiply that by A, A epsilon naught B E B T like that. So now let's write down Gauss's law. Integral P dot V area is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. That's Gauss, that's the uh, Gauss's law. So for this integral here, we just have the flux on this side. On the left, there's nothing. So that's just E times area. Okay. And on the right side, we could say we have sigma over epsilon naught times area, because sigma times area is going to be Q. And then we'll go ahead and plug that in and take a time derivative. So for the, for the field that we need right here, we'll solve sigma over epsilon naught, or that's q over a epsilon naught, either one. And now we can do this de dt. Magnitude, direction takes care of itself. We've got that right there. Yeah, that'll actually do the trick. 1 over A epsilon naught. DQ DT. If you want to take this one. And any way you look at it, it's just J over epsilon naught. And Having obtained this right here, just cross multiply over, and you've got the J equals epsilon naught D E D T. I'll do it partial. So that's exactly that consistency check that we have there. So as we've got charge flowing here, therefore current, we have the same magnitude of current that is flowing here, also flowing there. And when you take the divergence here, this thing vanishes outside. This one, this part vanishes inside. The sum of the two is always you know, the total current. Good. So that was the last thing we had to do in order to set up Maxwell's laws, Maxwell's equations. We had them all up on the board last time. I'm just going to list them, and then we're going to have to discuss Maxwell's equations in matter. Right? These will be basically in the vacuum first. These are the simple ones, these are the ones we like. The ones in matter we have to deal with a lot more minutia. So let's see here. Maxwell's equations that we'll be seeing a lot of now. Once we have this all in place and in the next chapter, chapter after, we'll be using these to discuss electromagnetic waves. That's one of the big big deals here, but let's just start with the full set as we now have them. Charge density over epsilon naught. Divergence of the magnetic field vanishes. Same as no magnetic monopoles. 
Faraday's law was the curl of E minus D D D T and then the Ampere Maxwell, the one we just finished discussing, we have mu naught current density plus mu naught epsilon naught V D D T. So those are the four equations that along with the force law on a charged particle gives us all of classical electrodynamics, fundamentally. So I'll just write here, along with the force law, but okay, so that would be Q, E plus V cross D force on a charge on a charged particle. These summarize classical electricity and magnetism. Material property that has to be dealt with. Fundamentally, you can take these and deduce everything um, that is known classically. Now, in matter, things are much different. So, here we're talking about the laws just for charges, charged particles that can, you know, free to move around. So, let's write here Maxwell's equations in matter. Now things are suddenly very complicated because we have bound charges, we have atoms, molecules, positive, negative charges that are all bound together and yet they can respond to a field. So if you impose a field on some material object, there's a response in the motion, the relative motion of the charged particles inside, we call that polarization, the relative separation distance. So in matter, let's write this, bound charges. Right, so you've got a chunk of matter here and then you've got atoms and they have you know, plus and minus in some form. Okay. And now you apply a field to that and you get a, you know, a tendency for these charges to separate. So bound charges, what I'm going to write here, respond to an applied field by separating. And that's what we call polarization. So separating, that's polarization. And uh, we have polarization P and magnetization M. So let me write that this way. Polarization P. We also have magnetization M. That's more orientation. So yeah, let's go ahead and do this. So suppose we have polarized atom charge is really separated. So this is the E field. 
E applied in that direction, that has produced the polarization. And of course, the polarization, I'll just from plus to minus, polarization opposes the applied field. E opposes E applied. And that's why we have these two equations the bound charge density is minus the divergence of P, and then the bound current density is just the curl of M. current density is the time derivative of the polarization vector. So this allows us to come up with another continuity equation, which we could say is a consistency check, because now divergence of J to B equals B dt divergence p okay working right off of this and now we're going to have a minus sign there equals minus the rho bound dt and and look we bring this together again to the other side these two and we have a continuity equation So this is good because we have the same formal properties that we have before. Okay. Equal zero. Continuity equation. Continuity equation. <clears throat> Okay, so now we're going to set up the Maxwell's, we already have this, now we're going to set up these other three equations, or these four equations, in matter, so that we get the same form, but they're now going to have to involve polarization and the magnetization as well. So let's just start with Gauss's law. Um, actually, we have to go before that. We're going to have our density now as the free charge, charge density plus bound charge. And that's going to be the free charge minus the divergence of the polarization, as we just defined up there. So when we do Gauss's law, as our first Maxwell equation, we have to have both of these in there, right? Because that's the definition, the free and the bound charge, that's all of the charge. We've got this divergence here, so we'll, we'll do both steps. So we plug in the rho f minus divergence of p, and to regain the form, we're just gonna bring this polarization into the definition of the electric field. So the divergence of epsilon naught E plus <coughs> P is now going to be equal to the right side here, okay. the free charge. And this will be 
had you must have had last semester too the electric displacement vector. There will be a there will actually be a relation between these two that we'll have in a moment. But notice that we get the form. We'll just call this D again. So that we get the simple form of divergence D is equal to now just a free charge density vector sheet. So that's our first Maxwell equation. And we want to get all four of them. The uh, magnet magnetism is not going to change. So the one divergence of B equals zero is not going to change. But now Faraday and Ampere have to be dealt with. So for Faraday, no, I have Ampere here first. So for Ampere's law, we have to replace Ampere. We have to take the current density and its constituent parts. So we're going to have free plus bound plus polarized. <clears throat> All three of these go into Ampere's law. So we're looking at Ampere's law. We've got the curl of the B field. You not all three of these. Plus curl of M plus B B B P. So you see how that's also going to work out. So we're going to bring this one over into the definition of B, and then we'll have those two parts again the way we did before. So we're going to get the same form, although we're adding some symbols. Oh, and actually we also still have plus mu naught epsilon naught B E D T. So we actually have that as well. So far, notice the P in the definition of the displacement field and the P over here. So, so far these things are starting to mix up. Okay, we've got the, the auxiliary field H, and that's just going to be H equals 1 over mu naught D minus the magnetization. <coughs> the auxiliary field, and now we have. We're going to bring that into the left. We still got the mu naught j and the p e and p are going to be in here as well. So here's the form we get. Curl of h is equal to free current density plus d displacement over time. Okay. So this mixes things up a bit. 
But if we first write the four Maxwell equations down that we now have with these, this auxiliary field and uh, this displacement, at first glance, they look like they have the same form. So I'm going to put these down. I should actually, okay, let's go ahead and just make sure all the definitions are here at once. First of all, we have Maxwell equations in matter now. Yeah, this is a bit complicated, but we do have a form that looks exactly or not quite exactly, better actually. We have the symmetry here where they're both zero. We have Faraday and then we have this new free current plus D D D T. Actually free density. Okay, so that looks really almost as simple as the original ones. The problem is, is that we have six extra quantities because we have, see, instead of just having B and E in this bunch of equations, we actually also have D and H. So what's required is the relation between all of these quantities. And then with the linear relations, they're actually going to boil down to the full analogon of the original ones, and we can work with those. So just for completeness, let me go ahead and put our definitions here. Well, actually I do. I have these right here. I have D is equal to plus B. So these definitions are going to go with this set of equations. And in order to make them tractable, we need what are called constituent relations. And constitutive relations, pardon me the linear media. So I'm going to put them all up here at once and then we can have the, everything on one board and kind of point at it and uh, try to see the relations here. So first of all, our polarization is directly proportional to the electric field via material constants. The same thing for our magnet magnetization being directly proportional to the auxiliary field, again, via material constants. The displacement field, same thing. these direct proportionalities and that allows us to bring these things right into shape again with a bunch of proportion material constants. Okay. So these are all linear media and linear media simply means you have the linear relationship. Since these could actually be expansion expanded in terms of each other, you would push them to a linear degree and then you would have a linear relation. Otherwise they could become quadratic in each other, etc. Then you would be in the in the realm of nonlinear media. You've heard about things like nonlinear optics, that would have to do with with these material constants. Good. So finishing these definitions here. 
one plus my electric mu is mu naught one plus my magnetic electric susceptibility magnetic susceptibility magnetic susceptibility okay <clears throat> So now if you see, if you look how you can start replacing these things and reducing them back to their simplest form, you can just take these things one at a time, right? You've got the B, you've got an E in terms of that. B, um, well, we'll leave B, so you, you can get the, the E in terms of the B. B and E and B here will, will stay completely the same, and then H you would have in terms of the B, um, D again in terms of the E. So those substitutions bring you back to the form that we originally had, the, you know, the simple one that's less confusing, and just at the price of knowing some material constants here. Okay, so that's good. What we're going to finish up with is boundary conditions. And these actually give a good opportunity to look at the integral theorems again. So these we'll go ahead and leave up here. And the first thing we're going to do is just convert these to their integral form in the same way that we took the original integral form and went to differential form. So we'll just reverse that, those steps. And in this case, it's actually enough to write them down and we'll even immediately see where the steps were. I'll, write, I'll just write the four of them down. So, so next, integral form. Of this whole setup here. In order to investigate boundary conditions. derive boundary conditions, boundary conditions, BC, standard. Now, the reason we're going to need boundary conditions, maybe I'll draw a little picture here. So, reflection and refraction from one medium to another, when we're talking about waves, even for reflection, you know, the law of reflection, we're going to get that with our electromagnetic waves, without a doubt. And if you're reflecting off of a certain medium, you need the boundary conditions, say, between vacuum and that medium. So those material constants are going to be in, in play. Um, and so reflection, yeah. And suppose you're doing refraction when we get there. To remind you, then you actually have, um, we'll get Snell's law eventually from one medium into the other. And this medium versus that second medium will be characterized by these material constants. Okay. So, yeah, that's why we need this form. As long as we're doing optics, wave optics, for example, in a vacuum, then we don't need these material constants at all, but as soon as we're working with the medium, then we are with matter, then we have to have boundary conditions based on these, and we need the integral form to get those boundary conditions. So I'll just put a little bit of a note of what I said there. For example, 
reflection and refraction of waves. Refraction and reflection of electromagnetic waves. So that's when that will come into play. So yeah, let's go ahead and look at these in their integral form. And that's just kind of a, a return back to what we had earlier. So in fact, I'll just write them down, all four of them, d dot dA equals free charge enclosed. And the reason there's no epsilon not here in Gauss's law is because of the way we define D, okay? Integral B dot DA, that's zero, okay? No magnetic monopoles. Integral E dot DL equals minus D over DP area and this is the boundary of the surface this is the surface and finally integral h dot dl is equal to free current that's enclosed plus ddt integral electric displacement da surface boundary of the surface. So where did these four come from? We just go from top to bottom here. This is just the integral form of Gauss's law. Okay. You just integrate both sides. You've got the divergence. You turn it into a flux inter, into, uh, integral. Um, yeah, so that's the I won't put the, what the surface is, a volume that's bounded by a surface. So it's the surface, the surface. So these two, same thing. This one you get a zero on the right, this time you had the volume integration of all the density. You got the charge. This is the one you changed by Gauss's integral theorem, okay? So this one's the same. These two, if you integrated both sides for us, as a surface integral, you had the curl both on the surface integral on the left, you had just B surface integral on the right, pulled out the time derivative. Then you use Stokes integral theorem and turned the curl into the line integral. And you did the same thing over here. Good, so yeah, that's how you go back and forth between differential and integral form, Gauss's integral and Stokes' integral theorem. Okay, so now we have that, and we wanna set up the boundary conditions. That'll give us a good application here. And in fact, I only have to do, well, let's go ahead and set these up. Okay, so the boundary we're talking about is just like here, between one medium and another. And I'll go ahead and erase this. conditions. Let's see here. So our first so boundary conditions of our first integral. I should have numbered these. So we're going to go through all four of them. So one on one board.
first example, good. First example is a surface. Okay, so it's a flux integral, and we're just between, just as we were up here, one and two, we're at the one and the two side, and we have free surface charge density, and we do one of those Gaussian pillbox type of surfaces. You know, and we'll have a surface normal here and a surface normal here. And what I'm showing is the surface density, charge density right in between there, okay? So I'll just write Gaussian pillbox in scare quotes. And then you have, just we're talking about the vector D, you have D1 dotted into N. And then minus D2 dotted into N. enough for me to draw one of these because those are parallel sides. Okay, that's why you get the minus sign. You get the opposite direction. And oh you know what? This is better if we call this a directed area element because And we've got B times A as an area, which is what we want. And then that's a, the charge enclosed in that little pillbox is the sigma times the area as well. So yeah, that gives us, since these are the perpendicular, these are the normals, we can say we have D1 perpendicular component minus D2 perpendicular component is equal to sigma three. Okay. So this is one equation. Okay. This is one equation because it's a perpendicular component. It's not a, okay. um, there's no freedom. It's one, it's one component of a vector, the perpendicular component. For equation two, we're going to have the same geometry, but we have zero on the right side. So equation two, same geometry, and we'll have B, one perpendicular minus B, two perpendicular equal to zero. And that two is one equation. So what about equations three and four? <clears throat> Equation three is a line integral, okay? These are surface integrals, this is a line integral. And what we're doing is we're crossing some surface here, okay? Similar to what we had there before, it has a surface normal, and we're enclosing it in this counterclockwise loop. So there's a DL and there's a DL. And what we can say is, and again, it's one up here and two down there, so we can have E1 dotted into this L minus E2 dotted into this L, so one of them versus the other one is equal to minus D over DT. Let's take the right side here, B dot D area. Okay. However, in the limiting case, we're just going to keep these lengths but let this thing get narrow and narrower because we're just at a surface. We can make this limit as narrow as we want which is going to kill the right side. 
So limit of a narrow loop. And then we have E1 parallel component minus E2 parallel component is equal to zero. I'm going to put a box around here. This is two equations because this parallel component you know, is a two component vector. Okay. Two out of three. These perpendicular ones are one out of three. So that was for equation three. Four is a bit more complicated, but uh, actually the same construction. And that's because what we're left with is the I enclosed. So when we, when we do the same construction on four with this narrow loop, this is going to vanish, but we're going to be left with an expression for this. And I'm just going to write that down. I'm just going to write it down, and I'll keep the left side of the board there for my last couple of statements. So for four, we have B sub 1 parallel component 1 over mu 1, that's the one side, minus 1 over mu 2, B sub 2 parallel component. So there's going to be two equations equals this vector k, which I'm going to define in a moment, cross n hat. And this comes from the current density. Before I write that down, let me just put the box around here. Two equations. So the reason I'm counting these equations is because 2, 4, 5, 6, that makes six equations. We need six equations because we have two vectors to specify. Okay. First order differential equations, six quantities, six equations to specify them. So that is consistent. So let's see, we're going to end with that. This case of F, I'll just put this as a final note. Free surface current density. Free surface current density. said here. The free and closed current is this object here dotted into and hat cross L hat for what it's worth. When we need to use these, we'll come back to the formulas. Um, yeah, where's the simplicity here? The simplicity is this set of equations with the constitutive rela um, relations or in their differential form, because these are just like our Maxwell equation. Okay. Yeah. Good, so what we're going to do next time is actually work with the simpler form again. We'll be jumping into chapter eight next and talking about 
conservation laws and things, so we'll be working with the more fundamental quantities. Then in chapter nine, it's all about waves, and then as we get deeper into that, then we have to start taking these things, reminding ourselves that we have them there, and, and plugging them in. Good, so that's it for today. See you guys next time.